three miles in 50 minutes and then a longer break. And there were cars and vans all along the way so that if we were thirsty, we could get a can of Donald Duck orange juice. I yes, remember that. Um, I had a canteen that I could carry water with me. We get apples. They didn't have trail mix back then. We made our own and we called it Gork. We would get that. Um, these were places that they were coming with you, these vans? Or these were just oh, places yeah. along but, the road? You where know, no, Pat I, and Junior and, and Mary, they, they, were they the followed us all the way. Mary put 900 miles on her car, Back taking before. care of us who walked 100 miles. Because it, it was cold and we realized that we couldn't walk together in a group, that everybody had a different set of pacing. So we were strung out about three miles wide, you know, three miles long, down Route 1. And one of the things that Mary would do and some of the others is they would go to the end of the line and march, and they would drive up to the person at the head, and, and they'd circle back. Water. And they knew where everyone was in the line of march. And if anyone was missing, they would look for us. You know, had we fallen by the wayside, we were, were we in danger of freezing to death, or had we just gone into a bar to use the bathroom? You know? I, I mean, that's what I mean when, when I said our lives were literally in their hands. And, and that level of, of trust, I think, carried us through the entire ERA campaign. Absolutely. And you know, one of the one of your names that I amazed were marching. Uh, I think we probably, I, I would have to look at the, I'm trying to write a, a, a book about this and I would have to look at it. Um, I think we probably had about 15 that left all together. Now it turns out that not everybody could make it the whole way and we just decided that was all right. That was fun. You know, um, Kay Brooks who turned I think 65, 65 on the road, while yeah. we were on the road, realized so she couldn't time. do 20 miles a day. So. She, she would do as much as she, she could. Had, she did as much as she could, and it was fine. The one thing that Junior hadn't looked into was the fact that for the first day, she had measured the march by the road, but we were working on a bike path that wound around like a snake. And what that meant was that we were walking more than 20 miles that first day. And what the books will tell you is that there's a wall at 20 miles. You know, going beyond that is real tough. And a lot of us really got hurt going beyond that because we, we did were hit the wall. Pushing no, too, we were pushing too hard, it was too far. And uh, plus, we were off the bike path, so we were going up Route 1 toward Dumfries uh, at 3.30, 4, 4.30 at night. It was January 9th, so it was already getting dark. It was during rush hour. The gravel on the side of the road was like this. And you could slip so easily. easily. And oh my, my knee still knows about that, you know, uh, because while these boots protected my ankles from twisting, I didn't have anything on my knees at, at the time. Um, but we made it to Dumfries. And since we had, like, no money, uh, the plan was that we would all ride home and sleep in our own beds. <laughs> so we wouldn't have to pay for a motel, you know. So this was all planned. So uh, my father-in-law, who's a West Point uh, graduate, retired lieutenant colonel, uh, working for the CIA and the Southern Patriarch, calls the house to uh, tease my husband about his errant wife walking off to Richmond, and I answer the phone, <laughs> and he says, why, 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 Georgia, I, I thought you were on your way to Richmond. I was miserable. I started with blisters. I ached. A beer is very good when your muscles hurt. That's one of the things we found out in our preparation. But there was no way I was going to let my father-in-law know how miserable I was. And I said, oh, yeah, well, well, fine. I mean, we were so close to home. We just came back to sleep in our own beds. And, and well, you know, take the van back to Dumfries tomorrow and start from there all over again. And second night, we were in Fredericksburg, so we stayed with Fredericksburg now people. Marianne and I were with Alice Rapson. 
Um, we're sitting up in this big bed, rolling our bandages for the next day, wondering <laughs> how many women over the years have been rolling bandages <laughs> for men. mostly for men, but at least we were rolling them for ourselves. We came down the next morning. Uh, your feet swell when you're walking that far. So we decided that we were going to elevate them, and we lay down on the rug and put our feet up against the wall. Yes. And there we were, and we're talking, and suddenly I'm saying, we got our feet against the wall. There are going to be footprints on this wall. And Alice comes in, and I said, oh, I'm so sorry we have our footprints on your wall. Not that we took our feet down, you understand. We, we were getting every last minute of foot elevation we could get. <laughs> Absolutely, because we couldn't fit into our shoes at the wall. Yeah, and Alice said, oh, we think footprints on the wall are wonderful conversation starters. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and that was such an amazing trip. There was one man who was with us, Pat, yeah. who was from Common Cause. And we did stay, end up staying a couple nights in a hotel. And one of the because hotels- Because we got money. At that point, yes. At that point, let me interrupt you and we'll go back to Pat. We got so much publicity from that first day; it excited feminists all over the place. People were literally driving down Route One to find us and literally throwing money at us. <laughs> wow. You know, and honking and a honking. honking constantly. So that after Fredericksburg, we actually had money to stay in motels and in the motel and go to dinner. We got to eat out, although there were a couple of occasions where women gave us meals. Mm -hmm. It was interesting because Pat was the one male in the group from Common Cause, and all the rest of us were women, and we would leave it to the van and change our socks, and if, if our clothing had gotten, the rest of our clothing had gotten too wet, we would pop the wet, wet, wet bra or underpants or whatever, and poor Pat didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> he was mortified. He turned bright red and eventually put himself in the corner of the thing, <laughs> looking at the corner, because he was so embarrassed by, and we could have cared less. We just wanted to get the wet clothes off and get back on the road. And then we got to that first motel, and it had beds that you could put a quarter in, and they would buy you. <laughs> oh. and, <laughs> and Pat was just more. And we volunteered to give him quarters if he wanted to vibrate his bed <laughs> because he was sleeping alone by himself. And that was the third night that we that was spent in a motel, and the fourth night was spent in because I remember I was on duty to bring supplies down for the fourth night. Right. Um, and I, for years, I, I, every time I drove that section of Route One, I'd sleep in the government motel that had gone down. And now Charles, I think Charles's husband came and got her and took her back for the first three nights. Uh -huh. And it wasn't until the fourth night. Of course, she didn't have any intention of walking the whole way. That's right. We, we were just Susan and Jan and Charles, you know, we were just going to walk out to Alexandria. And then, because I think we, I, we all had to go to work, and Charles had said, I think I'll go a bit further and <laughs> call, call my husband. <laughs> um, Anyway, so she made it the whole way, and she hadn't done any training yeah. at all. Yeah. But then she there did, were times she did better than I did. There were times when there were amazing. It's all that door because door political work. That's right. It was all the door to political work. Because there were people who stopped who knew who we were because of the press coverage. And I will never forget there was uh, as we were approaching the Richmond city limits, there was an elderly man who stopped his car. And up in front of her, she was in front. She got up early, and, and she was really out there without the rest of us. And he and I didn't know kind of what to think, because he was in a three-piece suit and so on, and I, I, I felt just a little uneasy. He looked so formal. And he came over, and he put his arms around me, and he was crying. He said, my wife died two weeks ago, and she believed. Ladysmith, we stopped at a little restaurant.
press from because it was time to get something. And the women there really welcomed us and said, everything's free. Just get anything you want. You know, we just believe in what you're doing and please don't forget Ladysmith. And they were the nicest women in the world. But, but just so you have the sequence right, Ladysmith came before the man in the, the man room. with the car. Yeah. And, and the women in Ladysmith also took all of our dirty, sweaty socks and washed them and dried, dried them and brought them back to us um, after the next day. I, and it was an amazing. And then you got to Richmond. Well, we got to Richmond, and the thing is, is we'd been on the road for five days. Uh, we had lost all semblance of civilized behavior. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, by the time we're getting close to Richmond, we we're in the Tidewater area, and they don't have a lot of big trees and, and bushes to hide behind when you need, when you to, need to pee. And right. we were stuck. Often we wouldn't have a place to pee, so you, you'd kind of spot the bushes. Right. Does this bush have the density <laughs> someone could pee behind it? <laughs> and I, I, had a, I had a blue uh, uh, balaclava yeah. yes, helmet with a little thing on top. And it, it also was very moist at that point. You know, the ground was really wet. So I would go over and, and Marianne could see my little blue top knot on my hat sort of sinking <laughs> as I, I tried to finish my business before I had sunk too much into <laughs> <the pot. laughs> But the, the women in Richmond, the Virginia, Richmond now welcomed us and they were a little more civilized than we were. We were and, kind of wild around the edges. And they thought, you know, they were going to be gracious southern hostesses and, and welcome us into their homes and feed us a nice dinner. Well, we went through everything on the table and it was gone. Because we were hungry, we'd lost all measure of civilized behavior. Mary Ann is out in the kitchen raiding the refrigerator. I mean, we didn't think to ask, we just went out in the kitchen, opened it up, we were eating. And the women were sort of horrified. And so they sent somebody out for fruit and as we were leaving, there was this big bowl of fruit right by the door on the way out. And everybody walked past, grabbed something, and dropped it in, the, the in, in our bras. <laughs> well, not, no, I didn't do it in my bra. I had it. I had a I had a sweatshirt, and I had my canteen. Oh, you around. had. Oh. So I just dropped it down in the sweatshirt, and the apples would bounce along, and, <laughs> and the grapes, and I got. After I grabbed the apple, I got about three steps away, and it sort of dawned on me that this wasn't civilized behavior. <laughs> so I stopped, and I turned around, and I said to our hostess, uh, we didn't used to behave this way, <laughs> but we've been on the road for five days, and just you know, walking past our friends with their trunks open, giving us food, and we would just grab something, and, and put it in our pockets or whatever, and we really didn't used to behave this way. And after apologizing, I walked out and I turned to Stephanie Earp, who was yes. our youngest walker. The youngest walker. She's she about was, 17. Yeah, about that. She was from Pennsylvania. And I said to her, wow, wasn't that fruit great? She said, yeah, I really wanted those grapes, but I didn't feel right grabbing them. <laughs> Yeah, what happened when you got there? When we got there, well, the reality is that our march had um, had shown their lie for what it was. Their lie was that the idea of equal rights for women was just something for uppity, educated, city-fied, urban women, and that real women, and certainly men, didn't need this or didn't approve of it absolutely didn't want it and all the way down that road I cannot tell you what kind of welcome personally we had from people. Oh, it people was would f hang out of bars and cheer us on. <laughs> you know, they the farmers in the pickup trucks with the gun rack on the back would honk and like this and this wonderful man who came out to welcome us in the name of his 
wife who'd been re re recently deceased. Uh, the motel we stayed in, uh, in Richmond, I went in the next day uh, to buy a little American flag for my son who was about two and a half to wave when he came down. And the man behind the counter said to me, I waved at you, did you see me? I thought, what do you say? I mean, he was so earnest. And I said, well, a lot of people waved at us. He says, I was driving the Greyhound bus bound for New York. And I hopped and gave you the thumbs up. And I said, yeah, I remember you. And he was so pleased. And I said to him, you know, until this March, I didn't think anybody cared. And his eyes filled with tears. And he said, people care. People really care. Because you see, the working class guys who have wives that need to work knew what a difference it would make for their family if, if, if their wives were getting a decent salary. I heard that over and over again. And this was also true of all the policemen that ever arrested us in D.C. Once they'd done their job, they were very welcoming. Having proved their uh, lie a lie for what it was, they met behind closed doors and with a unobserved and untallied vote, killed the ERA before we ever set foot in Richmond. That's when we were committee. And a committee. In a committee. No, it was Jim Thompson called a vote of the Democratic Caucus. Oh, that's right. And there was no one present. There was no no accountability at all and kill the ERA before we that's ever set foot in Richmond. And that is what... That's why we needed Marianne. That's why we needed Marianne, because we absolutely <laughs> had to get rid of that. Oh, he, he was a, He was vile. Yes. He was also gay. What? what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, do tell. <laughs> um, which I didn't realize. You're kidding. No, I didn't realize it at all in 75. That explains a lot. It does. Uh, but in 77, we got word through uh, the network from D.C. that he was gay, and there were men in D.C. who were willing to out him mm -hmm. in, oh. of course, in the midst of the campaign. And I said, no, we're not going to do that. If we had to Good that, for you. Good for you. If we, if we had to do that to win, then we're just like them, and yes. we used to do that. So we didn't do that. Three by five cards. Three by five cards. And yes. no We'd still three by five cards, but we wouldn't allocate them. Right, right. But right. you know, the, the thing was, that's what I meant by the moral underlay. Mm -hmm. That was, and we had each other at our backs at critical times when there were heavy yeah. risks. And that trust that came out of that shared belief, it was a certainty to us. I think really made a lot possible. Now, Joe Thompson, of course, meant he was going to be made as judge. judge. And that's a whole other story as to how we blocked that. Oh, that, that was important. That, that was important. important. It was yes. really important. I mean, can you imagine? Uh, uh, when you walked into to Richmond with the ERA, did people join you? Yes. Yes. And cheered. And mm -hmm. cheered and walked. And Marianne is jumping around like some little elf saying, Allison Cheek, bless my blister, and I walked a hundred miles. <laughs> and they, uh, somebody stuck their microphone in my face and said, is it true what the John Birch Society says? I said, what is the John Birch Society saying? You know, I mean, we weren't keeping up with that. And she says, that you're a bunch of paid professional walkers. <laughs> <laughs> With blisters on each foot, you my 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 uh, legs are taped to keep my varicose veins in place. I have a knee brace on one knee and an ace bandage on the other. This is not very professional. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, maybe it's not another Jim Thompson gay. Uh, I'm ha happy to report to you that he told Bernie Cohen. Right. Yes. Uh, he told Bernie Cohen that the happiest day of his life was when he marched in the gay pride parade in San Francisco, that he was finally free. Wow. 